name in housing research as one of our speakers at our monthly evict talk series mr katari is the speaker of today and he's the former un special reporter on adequate housing and he is currently a visiting professor at the graduate institute of international and development studies in geneva he also recently received a new mandate from the un human rights council to investigate the alleged violations of international human rights in the occupied Palestinian territories. I'm incredibly eager to hear more about his work as the first UN special reporter on adequate housing and of course about the development of the concept of the right to adequate housing. So without further ado, I will give the floor to Mr. Kotari. Mr. Kotari, are you here? Maybe you're still muted. Let's wait just a few more seconds. Maybe he's grabbing coffee. I think that um, he's muted. Ah. Yeah, I think you're muted. Mr. Kotari, if you're speaking, we cannot hear you. So I think your microphone is still muted. At the top of your screen, you can unmute yourself. Yes, hello, can you hear now? Uh, yes, now we can hear you, okay. thank you. Okay, okay, great, it was, wasn't was allowing unmute. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so thanks very much for this invitation and uh, it's great to know about the uh, evict uh, project. Uh, so I'm I'm just going to. Uh, I was just asking uh, Michelle if the you don't need to share the screen right now. Uh, I can tell you when to share it. Okay. Um, so I'm I'm just going to run you through the uh, the development of the right to adequate housing at the UN and also then the development of standards on forced evictions at the UN Human Rights Council. And uh, I can also explain how these standards have been used since they were adopted in uh, 2007. And uh, then we can have a discussion on the current state of uh, forced evictions. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the development of the right to adequate housing uh, of course, began with the adoption of the Covenant on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights. In Article 11, it was recognized as a component of the right to adequate standard of living. But the articulation of the right, what that actually meant, did not happen until 91, when the Economic, uh, the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights at the UN adopted a general comment, number four, on the right to adequate housing, um, in which they identified um, uh, seven elements of the right to adequate housing. They're saying without the satisfaction of these, we cannot say that the human right to adequate housing has been um, uh, satisfied. So this legal security of tenure, affordability, habitability, uh, availability of services, materials, facilities, and infrastructure, accessibility, and uh, location. Uh, then in, in 1997, the committee also adopted a general comment on forced evictions. And uh, in that general comment, they, um, they attempted to define what, what forced evictions are um, and also to just lay down some very general guidelines on how people can be protected uh, for, from uh, from forced evictions. Um, and uh, so, so the work the work actually continued, and I I was appointed as the first UN Special Rapporteur on Housing in the year 2000. And um, uh, the mandate was very broad. So it says Special Rapporteur on Adequate Housing, uh, 
in in uh, as a component of a right to adequate standard of living and uh, for the right to non discrimination in this context. So I interpret the ma I interpreted the mandate very broadly, taking a indivisibility of human rights approach, and um, essentially uh, re uh, you know expanded the elements of the right to adequate housing because I was also looking at the uh, civil and political rights dimensions of housing and related issues of land evictions uh, and so on. So I included elements like freedom from dispossession, information capacity and capacity building, uh, resettlement, uh, the right to safe environment and the right to security, uh, physical and privacy. Um, and uh, because it's a, it was a global mandate, I also decided to not only focus on countries in the south, but also to look at the crisis of housing um, in, in, in western, in northern countries. So I actually did missions, which is part of the work of the rapporteur is to uh, carry out a country missions. So I did missions in Spain, uh, Canada, and, uh, and Australia. Uh, and um, and of course, during the mandate, I had a my mandate was uh, almost eight years uh, because I was there during the transition from the Human Rights Commission to the uh, Human Rights uh, Commission on Human Rights to the Human Rights Council, and uh, I developed a number of standards, um, uh, I, guidelines on segregation and discrimination because I realized that was one of the key. Uh, you know, key crisis points uh, in housing in terms of segregation and, you know, spatial segregation, but also ghettoization and so on. Um, and then I developed uh, something called the basic principles and guidelines on development-based displacement and evictions, which I'll be speaking about in, in some detail. I also wanted to mention uh, in terms of standard setting the work of uh, the rapporteurs who succeeded me, so Raquel Rolnik from Brazil, who took over in 2008, um, developed some very useful standards. One of them was the guiding principles on security of tenure, and these I find uh, I, I find particularly important because she looked at uh, how um, recognizing different forms of security of tenure can protect against forced evictions. Uh, so. She was, you know, recommending prioritizing in situ evictions, uh, promoting the social function of property, uh, promoting women's security of, of tenure, um, and uh, you know, a number of other issues. You you can you can look at those. If uh, then subsequent to Raquel's mandate, uh, the most recent mandate, which was until um, 2020, uh, Leilani Farha from Canada also developed something called the guidelines for the implementation of the right to adequate housing. So, sort of strategies for implementation that um, governments can follow. And in those guidelines, she's also recognized uh, steps that need to be taken uh, to protect against. Uh, so, I I will now just run you through the content of the of the evictions guidelines so so when i became rapporteur it was very clear to me that the largest um, threat to adequate housing was uh, that there were millions of people around the world who were threatened with displacement um, for a range of reasons uh, development projects city beautification mineral extraction, uh, you know, there's a range, range of reasons which, which continues to be the case, of course, today. Um, and I realized that even though the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights had uh, done a general comment and uh, done some work on it, we didn't really have operational guidelines that you could hand over to a national government or a local municipality uh, which would help them to to protect uh, to safeguard people's rights before, during, and after displacement. So we went through a, sort of a four-year period of an analysis of um, national legislations, consultations with uh, different actors, um, some expert meetings on drafting, and uh, in 2007 I presented. Um, the text uh, in, in one of my annual reports. Uh, 
to the Human Rights Council, uh, which then uh, acknowledged them, and um, and you know subsequently they become the sort of operational standard on development-based displacement around the world. Uh, so I will just quickly run you through the contents, uh, and then we can. Um, I'll also, as I, as I said, I'll also explain how they are being used uh, today across the world. So if we can have the PowerPoint. Uh, Uh, yeah, next. Um, so, so the idea was, of course, to assist uh, states in developing law and policy, uh, to hold non-state actors accountable, and uh, and also as a tool for protecting uh, rights to housing and and related rights. Next. Uh, um, to minimize evictions, I think we realized right early on in the process of. Uh, of drafting that it was not practical to take a position that there should be no evictions, um, but uh, un, you know we had to develop under what conditions they should take place. And so we developed something called that evictions can only happen in exceptional circumstances, um, consistent with with international human rights law, um, and of course to ensure uh, compliance with human rights standards. Next. Um, so they were presented in 2007, acknowledged, uh, available in UN languages. Now they're available uh, in 23 languages uh, across the world. Next. Um, so, so the exceptional circumstances were uh, for the uh, purpose of promoting general welfare, and, and the guidelines actually define what, what general welfare is. Uh, and uh, of course, to protect health and well-being. So, you know, in in a situation where people are living in life-threatening conditions, they would need to be moved. Um, and uh, of course, they have to be reasonable and authorized, and in accordance with these guidelines. Next, uh, um, and they're very clear position that states bear the primary primary responsibility, primary obligation. And uh, but but responsibility is not limited only to states. It also extends to uh, non-state actors, including financial institutions and corporations. And some of, some of this work has, of course, now been developed with the UN uh, Business and Human Rights Guidelines. With the um, current work that is going on, in fact, there's a next week in, uh, the the working group meeting on the development of binding a binding treaty on transnational corporations and human rights. Uh, next. Um, so they're so human rights standards. So they're based on you know fundamental human rights principles. Uh, next, and uh, and the protection of the right to adequate housing, which obviously includes and this was recognized already in the general comment number four: protection against uh, against evictions and uh, the right to legal security of tenure. Uh, next. Uh, uh, so uh, the guidelines attempted to define what are forced evictions uh, involves the involuntary displacement of individual groups and communities from their homes and lands, um, and you, you, know, you can see the rest uh, next. Uh, and uh, these were the we, we identified. I mean, it was not a comprehensive list, but we identified uh, these. Um, uh, these types of projects that are often used, continue to be used uh, with the excuse that they are for public good or for social purpose, so infrastructure projects, urban renewal, slum upgrades, major business sporting events. We've seen the kind of evictions that take place during, uh, you know, football World Cups or during the Olympics, and so-called environmental purposes, which has now become, a, you know, uh, with, with the current move on climate change and on uh, by environmental protection has uh, become a very important issue. Next. Um, um, and of course, we wanted to very much focus also on, on uh, the, you know, the damage being done by the neoliberal approach and how market forces, speculation, the creation of special economic zones, industrial projects, also people being evicted because of the privatization of basic services, water and sanitation. Uh, you know, unsustainable uh, rent increases. Uh, next. Um, 
So it was, the guidelines say that uh, evictions are constitutional violations of human rights, uh, range of rights not only limited to housing, but as I said, it was an indivisibility perspect, uh, perspective. So we're also looking at security of the person, security of the home. And all of these are based on, uh, you know, human rights that are recognized in different uh, international instruments. Next. And of course, it's just a couple of paragraphs on the experience, global experience that evictions intensify inequality, social conflict and segregation. They affect, they affect the poorest and most marginalized sectors. Uh, and, and of course, we also wanted to point out that it's not only uh, property that is impacted, uh, but it's also, it's not only material impacts, but also non-material, so physical and psychological injuries. Next. Um, and so there, sort of, uh, there's this very strong protection and prevention element in the guidelines. So what are all the steps that states and non-state actors can take to prevent evictions? But we also, as I mentioned, we recognize that there are communities that uh, need to be moved uh, for health and life-threatening conditions. So the guidelines actually create a, a right to resettlement uh, and, of course, access to adequate legal and other remedies. Next. Um, so we took, there's a very strong gender perspective in the guidelines, um, recognizing the, you know, uh, critical impact impacts on, on women and, of course, also recognizing that evictions impact on different people differently. We can see uh, how they impact uh, the Roma in, in, in Europe. We can see how they impact you know, minorities across the world. Uh, and, of course, now we are seeing more and more how um, there are people who are defending their land and housing rights and defending their communities from being evicted who are now uh, human rights defenders. Uh, next, uh, the guidelines call for uh, the, these paragraphs refer to specific, uh, you know, paragraphs in the guidelines. They, they protect a range of rights, land, food, livelihood, participation, health, education. Next. Uh, so there's a quite a large section in the guidelines on protection, uh, prevention measures. Uh, the adoption of legislative measures, uh, the need for states to review the strategies and policies and laws that uh, that are not compatible with human rights standards. Next. Uh, uh, and and I think this was the first set of guide, first guidelines in the UN where we actually took a, we, uh, you know, we confronted the market forces directly and, and but through through the responsibility the regulatory responsibility of the state and and the guidelines say that uh, states must intervene to ensure that market forces do not increase the vulnerability of low income groups to evictions and and that that kind of intervention would include controlling land and real estate speculation and of course promoting human rights uh, across the different sectors next uh, so the guidelines, one of the ideas that we developed was that just like you have environmental impact assessment for environmental projects, um, there should be eviction impact assessments, uh, social impact assessments before a um, project is taking place which will lead to evictions. Uh, and that such an impact assessment should be, uh, uh, you know, should be done in a disaggregated manner and as I mentioned should also look at uh, material and non-material impacts, and and how it affects uh, different groups, and different communities, differently. Next, uh, um, and the the requirement in the guidelines is that these have to be, uh, you know, carried out prior to evictions, so that if there has to be resettlement and rehabilitation, uh, we have a we have a fairly good idea of what the damage has been done and what needs to be, uh, uh, rights need to be restored. Next. Um, yeah, uh, next, just more detail here. Um, also need for appropriate notice because the experience around the world is that many communities are evicted without sufficient notice, uh, sometimes just a few hours or a few days. So. Guidelines call for sufficient notice uh, and the responsibility on the state to 
to explore alternatives to evictions. Uh, in most cases, we've seen that even if projects have to go ahead, um, they can be done in a way in which a uh, minimum number of people are, are displaced. And of course, the requirement that in the entire process of planning uh, and, and if necessary, carrying out evictions, that people are, are consulted at all stages. Next. Uh, um, and of course, there has to be effective dissemination. Very often people don't know, they don't have information on what is going to happen, uh, when it's going to happen, what will happen to them after the evictions. And there's a range of requirements on carrying out public hearings, on having independent uh, monitors, uh, you know, on, on the field. Next. Uh, um, and of course, you know, all the information. Next. Uh, and then if an eviction has to be carried out again, experience around the world is that very often there's there's violence used, um, very often property is destroyed, so there's a need to have, uh, as I said, neutral observers, uh, and that evictions should not violate uh, the dignity or human rights of the affected. Um, next. Uh, protection of the rights of children, and there are very strict conditions that, and this is something we've seen in, even in COVID, uh, I'll come back to that, where the communities have been evicted even during the COVID pandemic. Uh, the guidelines say they should not happen during the bad weather at night, during festivals, during school exams. Uh, we've seen many, many cases where children have um, lost a year or more schooling because their all the books were destroyed, their homes were destroyed while exams were going on. Next. Uh, and after evictions, there's a big section on what needs to be done to ensure that people's rights are protected. Next. Uh, next. Uh, I'm, I'm rushing through this because I realize there's not that much time, actually. Um, and then there's a section on remedies. Uh, next. Uh, on, on compensation, and this compensation, of course, has to be based on uh, the information collected during the impact assessment. Next. Uh, and then one, there's one condition that if, let's say, rural communities are displaced and they're land-based communities, whether they're indigenous or small farmers, otherwise that the, compens the resettlement means there has to be land for land. You cannot give cash as compensation only. Uh, next. Uh, Next. Uh, let's uh, there one more. There should be something on next. Is that the last one? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And and then of course, in cases of evictions, it's often not possible communities to go back, but if it is possible, and let's say they've been evicted from a place because there was a need for a project and that project was not carried out, uh, they should be able to, when return is possible, they should be able to go back and, and get, you know, uh, all their rights restored. Uh, okay, so there's one more short PowerPoint on, uh, on how these guidelines have been used, which may be of interest. Uh, can you share the screen on that? Or? Just one second, I will do it. Yeah, so, so as I mentioned, since uh, their adoption in 2007, I've actually just uh, recently, for the last few years, on and off, been doing uh, some research work on how these guidelines have been used, and uh, I hope at some point to publish a monograph on that. But um, I already have quite a lot of information, so uh, uh, next. So obviously, the you know there are many many different uses of the guidelines. Uh, next, um, and including you know contributing to standard setting at the international and uh, national level, laws and policies, assisting law enforcement agencies. Uh, and next, um, being accountability, of course, and and they've been, you know, very useful for housing rights and uh, campaigns against evictions uh, and social movements. Next. Uh, 
So they've been extensively used uh, in the UN system. Uh, this is just a list of all the rapporteurs who have referred to the guidelines either in their annual reports or in their country missions uh, or use them um, to develop further standards. Next. Um, and uh, even rapporteurs who are uh, who are assigned with specific responsibility for particular countries have used them. Next. Uh, UN agencies have used them extensively uh, in their manuals, in their um, in the guidelines they've developed in in uh, assisting with the development projects uh, on the ground uh, in, in country situations. Uh, next. Uh, intergovernmental bodies, the Human Rights Council continues to use them. Uh, the UN General Assembly has used them in the context of uh, disasters uh, and a number of other UN intergovernmental bodies. Next. Uh, the treaty bodies continue to use them. In fact, the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights now requires the countries when they're reporting on on their compliance with the right with the right to adequate housing in the covenant to to use uh, to use the guidelines. So they're in their in their in their reporting guidelines, and they use them in their concluding observations, which is the so judgments that they give when they review. Uh, country, you know, status of countries according to the covenant. And similarly, number of other uh, treaty bodies. The Committee on um, the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women has developed a general recommendation on the rights of rural women, and in that they, they extensively use the guide, uh, evictions guidelines. Next. Uh, Interagency bodies are also using them. I won't go into details. Next. Uh, um, UN guidance notes. Now the Secretary General issues guidance notes for uh, UN country teams, and uh, you know uh, UNDP, for example, has developed social and environmental standards. There's one on displacement and resettlement that also uses the guidelines. Next. Um, so here's some examples of further standard setting, and I mentioned the guidelines on security of tenure uh, from Raquel Rolnik. Uh, Olivier de Chouture, uh, when he was a rapporteur on right to food, developed a um, set of minimum principles on large-scale land acquisitions. He used the guidelines. The African Commission has principles and guidelines on the implementation of ESC rights in the African Charter. They extensively use the guidelines. And there's a number of other examples. Um, next. Uh, we, we have more and more cases of uh, in court judgments uh, in Kenya, India, Uganda, South Africa, Mexico that have used um, that have used the guidelines. Uh, I can give you one example in Kenya. The High Court referred to the guidelines in an eviction case in Nairobi and actually told the government that because the, Kenya doesn't have a national um, policy or law on evictions and resettlement, and the court said that until they do, they should use the UN guidelines uh, at the national level as national law and policy. Um, uh, next. Um, so these are the countries where there are national laws and policies now that have been developed uh, that, that refer to the guidelines. Next. Uh, national human rights commissions are extensively using them in their work when they examine specific eviction cases. Uh, next. Uh, and of course, <laughs> NGOs have used them. Amnesty uses them all the time in their country um, country reports, and a number of other organizations uh, continue to use them. Next, uh, uh, there's a range of pedagogic uses: manuals, handbooks, legal guides, primers, toolkits have been developed uh, either either on based on the evictions or uh, if they're generally on displacement, uh, they use the guidelines. Next. Uh, in development cooperation, a number of countries, uh, so the Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation Development in Germany, uh, German Development Bank has the guidelines as conditions that have to be uh, complied with in all their, in their development projects. The International Finance Corporation has used them in their Performance Standard, the European Bank, European Investment Bank. In fact, even now they're currently revising their uh, standards on resettlement and their 
they've used them, but they're going to use them even more uh, next. Um, so the, across the academic uh, spectrum, uh, you find uh, academic articles, analysis, op-eds uh, from a range of, this is very great to see because the idea was that it shouldn't just be a legal instrument, but it should very much impact on social sciences and so they're being used um, in different, uh, you'll see a, quite a lot of reference to them. Next. And, and of course, uh, you know, these are meant for development-based displacement, but they are very useful for climate change issues. Uh, they protect communities against relocation and adaptation. Uh, the impact assessment provision is very useful. The right to resettle is very useful. Uh, so now there are a um, number of countries that are using them. Fiji, for example, is using them because they are actively relocating uh, villages and settlements that are threatened with displacement uh, and there's a number of other uh, institutions that are using them in the context of climate change. Next. Okay, so that was just a quick run through. I, I apologize, I, I'm, you know, I had to rush because I'm, I'm aware of the time. I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, in spite of all these developments, of course, the situation of evictions continues to be very grave across the world. Uh, I can just tell you from, um, you know, from my, my own country, there's a recent study that's been done by the uh, Housing and Land Rights Network in India and um, extensive uh, overview of evictions and they found that um, even during the pandemic period, um, over a quarter of a million people have been evicted, almost 21 people um, evicted from their homes every year. And uh, so that's just in India, but you know, evictions continue across the world because the development policies, the neoliberal approach and all of that, the continued extraction of um, fossil fuels, uh, now all these, you know, using environmental excuses, uh, the financialization of housing, range of reasons, uh, evictions do continue. And, um, uh, and one of the issues also is that we don't have uh, data is very hard to come by. Uh, that's why I'm very happy about this project. Um, and we need we need much more work. Uh, we need more collaboration with the UN. The current UN Rapporteur on Housing uh, is also working on evictions. We also need more <coughs> work uh, across social movements and and in, uh, intersectoral work. You know, between academics, uh, social movements, NGOs, national human rights commissions. Uh, some of that is happening, but um, much more is much more is needed, and um, I I can stop here, or if you want me to say a few words about the, the commission on inquiry, I can say that as well. Um, I don't know, it's up to you. Uh, yeah, sure. Go, please go ahead and tell us more. I think we have some a few more minutes left, and then we can go over and see if there are any questions. Okay, great. So um, in in May of this year, I think all of you are aware there was a uh, there were incidents in uh, in in Palestine and, and Israel. There was a, a community called Sheikh Jarrah in East Jerusalem, which was threatened with evictions um, by Israel and a community of Palestinians. And uh, there was a you know there was a warning actually by Hamas in Gaza that uh, to the Israeli government that you have to stop uh, threatening people and stop evicting and if you don't, then there could be a conflict. And of course, they didn't. So uh, there were rockets fired, and then there was retaliation, and there was great damage done in Gaza, but also in in southern Israel. So there was a special session called by the Human Rights Council, where they adopted a resolution and said that uh, a very grave situation continues to be, and we need to appoint a an independent commission of inquiry. Uh, independent commission of inquiry is a very high level, um, you know, investigative body that um, that actually investigates on the ground. So there was a resolution adopted calling for such a body um, and asking the commission to uh, not only, you know, investigate and assign accountability for what happened in May, but also to investigate and the resolution says all underlying root causes of recurrent tensions, instability, and protraction of conflict 
including system systematic discrimination and repression based on national, ethnic, racial, and religious um, identity. This commission, there are a number of commissions at the UN. There's one on Syria, there's one on South Sudan, um, but this, and there have been previous commissions on the occupied territories, but this one is unique in many ways. One is that it's open-ended, so it doesn't, the mandate doesn't have to be renewed every year. Uh, the second is that it's, it's been assigned to um, establish accountability and collect evidence, and the evidence has to be of the standard of quality where it can even be admitted, uh, submitted to the International Criminal Court. We also have to identify perpetrators. We have to do an extensive uh, collection of information and analysis, forensic information, and so on. So it's uh, there are three members uh, the commission. The Navi Pillai, who was the former High Commissioner for Human Rights, is chair. Uh, Chris Sidoti, who is an expert on national human rights institutions from Australia, and and myself. And um, we are just starting the work. So next month. There's the first meeting of the commission in Geneva, and then we'll we'll probably be going down to the field. Uh, Israel has said they will not cooperate uh, with the commission, but um, we hope to be able to go to Gaza from Egypt, and we'll of course be taking testimonies and uh, you know speaking to people in we'll be on the field in in um, in Amman and Beirut and uh, and in Cairo. So uh, that's the situation. It's a it's a very overwhelming mandate, uh, but we hope to make some contribution. So thanks very much. We can Thank it. you very much for uh, your interesting presentation, and especially also for uh, this last edition about your uh, new uh, project that uh, is going to start next month. Um, I found it really interesting, uh, especially also uh, the part about how the guidelines are currently used and have been used. Um, I have a lot of questions, but I can assume that a lot of people have many questions. So I'll first give the opportunity to uh, everyone else to ask questions. Uh, most of you have your camera off, but uh, if you can turn your camera on, you can uh, ask a question by raising your hand and otherwise uh, please use the chat and I will give you the word and you can turn on your mic. So if you have any questions, please let me know. I'm also not quite sure if I can see everyone, but I think I can. Yes, Michel, go ahead. Thanks so much, Milun, for this interesting presentation. And it's great to see that your work as developer of the guidelines is so uh, successful by uh, you show us that it's used uh, by these different bodies. But I'm interested in your thoughts about the uh, Committee on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights. They issued a number of um, decisions in individual cases, uh, more specifically the Bien Yazia case. I don't know whether they refer to the guidelines over there, but maybe you can reflect a little bit on that type of decisions where Spain being, uh, or where it's decided that Spain is basically violating Article 11 of the International Covenant. So what do you think of that development uh, and these decisions? Should I, should I take a series of questions, or should I answer one by one? Or? No, you can just answer one by one. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks for pointing that out. The, the, it's a very welcome development that we have a optional protocol, a complaint mechanism to the covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights. And a number of cases uh, that the committee has dealt with are on Spain. Uh, in, in these cases, they haven't... Um, uh, explicitly refer to the guidelines, but of course they're using the concepts and the content. Um, and and as I mentioned, it's part of their you know reporting guidelines, and they continue to use them in their concluding observations. Uh, I think it's a very good development. I haven't actually followed in detail whether these countries have complied, but it definitely raises the profile of. Um, you know, uh, what needs to be done in, in such cases. And I think it's also a major contribution towards the um, sort of legal development of um, of the rights that we have, specific cases that, uh, that the committee is taking up. And I think there's some others that are uh, 
coming. I, I my recommendation is for groups working on evictions to to continue to file cases um, to the committee, and it would be great if you know there were more cases from Europe as well, uh, and to see and not only to and to also focus on on the impact of non-state actors because as you know the committee has also been doing work on what are called extraterritorial obligations and i think it's very important for them to uh, also identify the responsibility of, uh, of private actors thanks thank you anyone else with a question you can also raise your hand in the blue jeans. Yes, Mr. Muller, please go ahead. Good afternoon, um, everyone, and thank you, Miloon, for your presentation. Um, I'm joining in from South Africa. I have a Hi. question that is perhaps unique from South African perspective. Mm -hmm. I appreciate and I understand that when the International Covenant and the general comments and your development-based principles were published, that it was important to stress the interrelatedness, interdependentness, and mutually supportive nature of all human rights. But I wonder sometimes whether that has not been overemphasized. The point I want to make is, in the South African Constitutional Court, there's been a number of cases, I think it's tracking up to eight cases now, where explicitly, housing cases um, where the characteristics you mentioned could have been used or developed, um, or at least the anti-eviction provision in 26.3 of the constitution could have been used, but wasn't. It was rather the, the cases were framed as violations of dignity or freedom and security of the person or equality. So this is my question. I wonder whether the interdependentness that was stressed 10, 20, 30 years ago has not derogated from the content and the veracity of adequate housing and the anti-eviction measures. Thank you. Okay, well, that's an excellent question. I, I think that um, you know the, the, the difficulty we have is that courts, uh, including you know in countries where uh, you know, economic social cultural rights have been recognized of equal standing, um, are still comfortable with the sort of civil and political rights approach. So they, they tend to, you know, lean in that direction. Um, but I think that uh, it's, a, um, I, I think the, the affidavits that are submitted uh, perhaps need to be stronger on, on the economic social cultural rights dimensions. The, the, the purpose of taking indivisibility approach was not to, you know, not to make go to the other extreme and dilute, uh, but actually uh, to strengthen economic, social, and cultural rights. Because at that time, when we were doing all this work, um, these rights were very much marginalized, uh, even in the international system. And and so it was important to say that, and also strategically, sometimes when we are speaking to governments or lawyers uh, or in court. Uh, it's sometimes easier to enter the the economic, social, cultural rights issues through civil and political rights, you know, dimensions. So I think that uh, the, the the examples. I think I would refer you. Uh, I can send you more details. But the adjudication on evictions issues from Kenya, from uh, India, um, actually shows how strongly the economic, social, cultural rights dimension are used. And maybe these need to be more widely publicized in, in, in South Africa. The other thing with South African courts, uh, I had actually submitted an affidavit after I became rapporteur in a, in a case um, on there was a new legislation on um, illegal occupations in, in Durban, which was, you know, anti-constitutional, as you know. Um, and uh, uh, the, what I noticed is that the courts don't very much use international standards. There's a kind of a feeling that the South African uh, constitution is very strong, which it is. Uh, but recently I came across a case, I don't have the details now, where they actually did use the evictions guidelines. Uh, I don't know if it was in Johannesburg or uh, I can I can send you the details. And it'd be interesting to see what that court did as opposed to, uh, you know, contrasted with what, what you were mentioning. But I think it just requires more work from 
from the lawyers and making sure that the affidavits uh, cover those dimensions. Thanks. Anyone else with a question? Otherwise, I have a question if no one else has one. No? Okay. Well, I, like I said, I was uh, very inter interested about the, the presentation where it talks about the use of the guidelines. And uh, it was great to see that on so many levels the guidelines uh, are used and have been used. But as a legal scholar, I am, of course, automatically very interested in uh, the use of these guidelines by courts and um, national laws that have implemented these guidelines. But I was wondering, uh, when you started drafting these guidelines, did you have some sort of a preferred way of using these guidelines or a preferred way of how uh, institutions and um, states would implement these guidelines? Uh, no, there was no, you know, there was no specific, uh, the only uh, question that I insisted that we do not lose is one is that they should be in a sort of simpler language because you know I come from a strong civil society background and I know that social movements uh, you know need these standards and as we've also seen with the current development of the of UNRWA of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Peasants uh, it's very important that they're framed in um, not too legalistic a term. And I also was very conscious of the fact that um, that there's so many dimensions of evictions which go well beyond law, you know, which cover a lot of social uh, social issues. And, and also when, during my experience doing carrying out country missions, I also found when I met with ministers of housing and, you know, ministers of planning that they, their approach was not a legal approach. I mean, they, their approach was, you know, was very different. And, and they don't read legal articles with hundreds of footnotes. They don't look at, you know, uh, so, 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 so it's very, it was very important to uh, take a sort of a cross-sectoral approach. And that's why I'm also very happy that they've been used. They've been used by planners. They've been used by surveyors. Uh, you know, they're, they're being used uh, by you know, people who carry out uh, social impact assessments were not necessarily lawyers. Um, so the idea was that they would be, uh, and, and that they would be of use uh, far wider than just the legal community. Uh, and, and um, you know, my not being a lawyer, I'm actually an architect by training. Um, I think I think it helps. But uh, but you can see a number of standards that have been developed at the UN now that, that it's a more what we call a more holistic uh, approach. Thank you. Anyone else with a question? Emma, do you have a question? Emma, please go ahead. Sorry, I don't know how to raise my hand in blue jeans. Um, that's embarrassing. Um, I wanted to ask, like, because you said something and that was kind of highlighted throughout the presentation um, that I found really interesting, um, but basically that you took a very gendered perspective on the development of the eviction guidelines, um, and multiple times through the presentation there was mention of like women being co-beneficiaries of compensation, um, and you know the how this was used later on by uh, the UN Convention Commission on Women's Rights and stuff, um, and I was wondering in in taking that perspective is that an idea you entered with or like, so did you know that you wanted to have this gendered perspective or did it kind of develop um, organically like on uh, the missions that the rapporteur has to go on and like in speaking with civil society members, if that makes sense. Oh, it's a good question. I, I think it comes from, you know, my many years of experience working on the field and working with you know, women's groups also, but also when, whenever I did, whenever I did missions, I sort of insisted on meeting with uh, women separately um, on the field, you know, doing, and also I think what helped was I was, during my uh, time as rapporteur, I was asked by the, uh, by the Commission on Human Rights to carry out a study on women's rights to housing, land, property, and inheritance. So there's a, there's a four-year study and getting into that because that study also was based on 
regional consultations we had around the world with, with grassroots women. And it was very clear to me when I heard all the testimonies that that women are impacted differently uh, from uh, from evictions. But not only that, but that they also play a very important role in in being in the front line of resisting evictions. And in fact, the, the women's perspective on on resettlement, rehabilitation, you know, even upgradation is is very very important. So I I, I think it comes from all of those experiences, and also obviously very conscious. I think most rapporteurs are conscious that they have to have a gender equality perspective. Now it's it depends how deep they go into that, but that's also been my life experience. So I I, I hope they're reflected. I mean, people have said that these are the probably the most gendered guidelines that have ever come out of the UN, uh, and I'm happy to hear that. But but I think I'd be, it, it's it's something that, I, I actually don't see what other approach can be taken. Because if you don't do that, you're missing out on, missing out on a lot. Thank you. Anyone else? I think we have time for one large question or two. Smaller questions. Michel, go ahead. I'm, all, I'm most happy, uh, most willing to give way to another person with a question. But I had another question. So if nobody else wants to ask a question, I want to ask whether the, or I believe that the, the guidelines are applicable to cases about rent arrears and mortgage arrears evictions. Um, and I don't want to make this whole project too Eurocentric, but I think in Europe and also in the States, I see someone from Eviction Lab as well. Most of the evictions do with mortgage arrears or rent arrears. Um, still, I don't, in the Netherlands and in Europe, I don't see many judges referring to UN guidelines uh, on forced evictions because they believe they're all dealing with development evictions um, and so on. So what's your experience with that? Do you know that guidelines are being invoked in cases uh, on rent arrears evictions, mortgage arrears evictions, um, and how can we use them? Because there are that many, and of course there's also a clear incentive why there should be the threat maybe of evictions, because otherwise people may stop uh, paying their rent or mortgage, or uh, people believe that's, that's the case. I'm not sure whether that's really the case, but still. Can you reflect a little bit on that? Sure. Um, I don't have specific examples, but I think the provisions in the guidelines that, um, you know, no one should be rendered homeless uh, because of, you know, either mortgage situations or rent arrears or or the COVID uh, crisis now um, are, are very important. I know that um, the Barcelona City Council has used these guidelines and in fact they, they are, you know, protecting people from that. Um, I, you know, the thing with standards is that sometimes they are used, but they're not referred, right? So we don't know actually where. So I know that the social movements in Berlin right now are very conscious of these and, uh, you know, the current situation that's going on with the expropriation. I mean, there's some, some major advances there on the city being able to expropriate um, large real estate, uh, real estate, what is owned by large real estate firms. But again, it's a similar answer Michelle, to what I was saying to um, on the South Africa case to Gustav that uh, I think all of you have to do more work in terms of filing more affidavits that use these standards, um, you know, and, and to, to point out specific um, articles and, and also perhaps refer to, I mean, there's this strange situation where there's a kind of an arrogance in European courts. They don't like to refer to cases from the southern countries or, you know, so, but why not? I mean, I, I don't see what the, in many southern countries that law has advanced uh, far more, you know, um, and as a, so, so maybe to put in those examples in the affidavits, maybe to use that logic, uh, you know, in the South African cases, there's some been very interesting work. Uh, with Justice Yakub and others, and and in India, there's a number of cases that have very, very um, creatively used uh, international standards uh, from a sort of humanistic perspective. Um, so I think we need to. I mean, that's the kind of homework we still have to do to make sure that uh, all these insights from around the world are are captured and 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 are used in the courts. Uh, 
thank you. Oh, there's one question in the chat. Uh, Mr. Muller, do you care to elaborate? Yes, sorry, colleagues. Um, I, I think uh, the 1998 article by Professor Carl Clare from Northwestern um, obviously wrote in the South African context about transformative constitutionalism. And many scholars around the world have, have written about transformative constitutionalism in the South African context. But I think a lot of scholars forget the first part of that article that deals with legal culture. And I think what Maloon is trying to get at is the fact that Yes, we may have this long-term vision of enactment and legislative development and interpretation, but that cannot be done from a conservative base. Um, and if we if we educate people, and, and Michelle focuses in this project on, on advancing housing rights and anti-eviction measures, perhaps part of the project should be also to fight conservative legal culture um, in advancing constrained, um, stressed arguments based on civil and political rights like dignity, um, equality. Because yes, that, that can save the day, but perhaps it may be worthwhile to push um, adequate housing and anti-eviction measures within the larger housing scheme proper and not uh, request um, civil and political rights or even due process rights to do the heavy lifting in this uh, instance. I, I completely agree. Thanks for that. I, I think it's also very important to look at legal culture across across cultures, right? Across traditions. I mean, in India, we have this very strong public interest litigation culture, the culture of Suomoto, where the you know if there's an eviction happening, the judge himself or herself takes on on the case. So I, I think it's very important to refer to that those. But I would also stress that I think it would be a mistake for us to think that. The practice of forced evictions can be stopped only through the courts. It, it's that's not going to happen. In, in my experience, I found, you know, when we worked on displacement cases in in Delhi, in Chennai, in in even in Nairobi, there, there's a lot of um, administrative actions that can be taken uh, to stop evictions. They can be stopped through policies. They can be stopped through change, <coughs> change in economic policies. Um, and I think we need to be conscious of that. So for lawyers and legal scholars and others i think i think it's important to open up the minds and say okay even if we are you know stuck with taking a legal approach let's at least make the legal approach more holistic and more sensitive to to other fields so so i would absolutely say that you know in affidavits and others we have to bring in all the social science arguments all the humanities arguments uh, all the morality arguments uh, that are, that may not necessarily be uh, be legalistic. I find I find law to be a constraint in in many many situations, not only related to evictions. And I think we should be uh, honest about that, and and we should be you know humble about that. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's five o'clock. Uh, we always try to end uh, this session sharply at five. That uh, almost uh, happened. So thank you, uh, Mr. Kotai, for your uh, presentation. Thanks, everyone, for your contribution. I think that the two most important messages, messages that we, at least I, take away is that there is already a lot been done on evictions and housing rights, uh, especially on many levels. But uh, the other message is that there is still a lot to be done. And uh, I think that everyone who's here is working to achieve that. So uh, let's keep up the good work and uh, try to uh, work together more often to, uh, well, combine our forces. And I want to invite you to join our uh, next talk on the 18th of November with Dr. Jesse Holman from Australia. That's our next talk. Again, thank you so much for uh, showing up and for the presentation. And uh, hopefully we see you in November. Okay, thanks very much. Good to meet everyone. And Let's, let's stay in touch. All the best with the project. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.